as we have been investigating DHA effects and as we uh, recognized that the DHA effects um, are exerted through the conversion of DHA to testosterone, uh, and as we recognized that the lower the testosterone level of a patient was when she came to us, and the higher we got it with DHEA supplementation, the better her pregnancy chances subsequently in IVF were. Uh, that suddenly raised for us the question uh, whether diminished ovarian reserve in itself may not represent simply a low androgen situation, a hypoandrogenism, as we call it medically. And so the paper that we just recently published in Human Reproduction uh, investigated that question. And what we, what we basically did here is uh, we took two distinct patient groups with diminished ovarian reserve. We took the typical older woman uh, who develops diminished ovarian reserve because she's getting older, meaning above age 40. And secondly, we took younger women with what we call premature ovarian aging, who at very young ages already show significantly diminished ovarian reserve by FSH and or low AMH levels. And we looked at the androgen levels, and we compared those androgen levels to young women with normal ovarian reserve egg donors. And not surprisingly, uh, based on what we had recognized previously in our analysis of our patients undergoing DGA treatment, we found that a really uh, both uh, uh, premature ovarian aging and uh, ovarian aging due to advanced age are characterized by unusually low androgen levels. And this is actually quite interesting because it is uh, expected that androgen levels decline as we get older. So finding low androgen levels in women above age 40 was not a surprise, even though 40 is not a, a real old age. And you know the degree of, of low androgens, even at that point, could be seen as somewhat surprising. But what really surprised us is that women with premature ovarian aging even showed lower androgen levels than women at older age with diminished ovarian reserve. And uh, this is a very important finding potentially because like frequently in medicine the question is what's first the chicken or the egg? Is the low androgen the initial defect uh, leading to diminished ovarian reserve, or is diminished ovarian reserve the initial defect l leading to low androgen? And the fact that you f find low androgens also uh, in young women with premature ovarian aging, and, and even to a more extreme degree, uh, strongly suggests that the androgen defect may come first. And that in turn is very interesting because uh, a large portion of androgens in women is produced by the adrenals. Uh, the other portion is produced by the ovaries. Uh, particularly DHEA is exclusively produced by the adrenals. And so that may suggest that POA, premature ovarian aging, is maybe not at least exclusively only an ovarian disease or an ovarian condition, but may actually represent an adrenal insufficiency. And this is very, very interesting because it is the mirror image 
of what we now know already for a number of decades about PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, where the high androgen levels are coming both from adrenal and ovary. And so a concept is evolving here, and that was really the main, or one of the main messages of our paper in human reproduction, that diminished ovarian reserve uh, at least in its POA form, in its premature and aging form, may be the functional counterpart to PCOS. In PCOS, you have high androgen, lots of follicles, very high functional ovarian reserve. In POA, you have exactly the opposite. You have low, you have diminished functional ovarian reserve, very low androgen levels, and very few follicles. Uh, and both of those appear to have adrenal as well as ovarian components. So they may represent opposite extremes of the same physiological process, not dissimilar to hypo or hyperthyroidism, for example, for the thyroid or, or, or other endocrine organ conditions where you can have over or under function. And so in that sense, uh, this is a very important uh, paper that may shed new light on the pathophysiology of the process. Yeah, the question why uh, testosterone or higher testosterone levels are good for fertility when very high testosterone levels, such as in PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, are bad, is, is a very good question. Uh, and it is a, indeed not only a question that has been puzzling us in this field for a very long time, uh, but it was actually the fact that uh, very high androgen levels in PCOS are perceived as being bad, which is a, a, a big reason why high testosterone levels for decades have been considered a bad thing in, in infertility. What we are now understanding is that probably like almost anywhere in medicine, uh, what is important is a range. If you fall below the range, it's bad. But if you exceed the range and go into toxic levels, it is also bad. Uh, and that very likely applies to uh, androgen levels as well. Uh, too low levels will stop the growth of, of uh, early small growing follicles. On the other hand, if you get too high androgen levels, uh, then you may get into toxic range and you may also get adverse effects. That is one issue. So the concept of range is, is, a, is a very important concept to, to, to consider. The second very important issue here is that uh, not reported in, in our paper, but another topic we are currently very actively pursuing is that once again from animal models, we know that in these early stages of follicle maturation, there is a synergistic, meaning a cooperative effect uh, between androgens, between testosterone and FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And that is also a somewhat surprising finding uh, because these early stages of follicle maturation have been in generally considered not to be FSH dependent. In other words, FSH sensitivity uh, was believed to kick in only at much later stages of follicle maturation. Animal work now very strongly suggests that um, even at those early follicle stages, what androgens do is they sensitize granulosa cell to uh, FSH effects. And so uh, androgens and FSH 
uh, kind of uh, work together giving uh, making two plus two appear to be five or six rather than just four uh, and that is a very uh, important potential concept clinically as well because it allows us to manipulate um, our treatments of patients uh, but more importantly what it what it demonstrates is something that we here at CHR uh, have been developing for quite a while and and I actually uh, with uh, Dr. Weikhoff uh, who is a, a, a visiting scientist from uh, Vienna University in Austria a few years back uh, wrote a paper in human reproduction on the subject. Uh, we, we believe that increasingly as we are trying to develop individualized treatments, we will go away from working towards certain specific hormone levels. Let's say wanting to get a certain androgen level or a certain testosterone or a certain FSH level or want to stay below a certain level. And instead, we'll start looking at how different hormones interact with each other. In other words, in this example, where we know that testosterone and FSH work together, the important thing may not be what's the absolute level of FSH and what's the absolute level of androgen, but what is the ratio between the two. If one goes up, the other one needs to go up too, and if they don't, if they are not in sync, then even though you may have good levels in one, you may still not have an ideal environment uh, where you want to be. So this is a very quickly evolving concept here at CHR. We are doing a lot of research on this, uh, and again, uh, I think the androgens uh, are, are leading here and once again uh, the idea came from what some of our colleagues recognized happening uh, in mouse models.